Greetings and salutations! Today we are going to be talking about things that rotate. Things that spin round and round like a record because, well, there is this widespread notion in the world of cycling that things of this particular nature have a massive impact on your riding. Well, massive negative impact in fact. Twice as massive, although that claim changes from source to source. However, it is quite well uh, accepted in the cycling folklore that having lighter wheels is better than having lighter anything else. Now, of course, there is a grain of truth to this claim. However, as they say, the gin lies in the details. Uh, thus, well, in our case, the gin lies in the magnitude of the grain of truth that is being discussed. Let's start with a refresher. What makes you slow? And that is, of course, the force of drag. And there are three sources of drag on a bicycle. The easiest one to analyze in this particular context is the aerodynamic drag. And that is because aerodynamic drag is entirely based on the shape of the item that is being moved through air. It is not affected by weight. Therefore, if the shape remains the same, the drag remains the same. The second source of drag is the mechanical drag, which is stuff rolling on stuff, rubbing on other stuff and thereabouts. Obviously, every mechanical part on a bicycle, when the bicycle is being operated, is generating some sort of drag. However, as minor as this force truly is, it is only dependent at worst, sometimes it's independent at all, however, it is at worst only dependent on the static weight of the bicycle and the rider and his gear and whatnot. It is not dependent on the fact that the wheels are rotating. And, well, the third source of drag is obviously the gravity. And the gravity is pretty simple because as you're riding up or you're riding down, you're either gaining or losing potential energy. And potential energy is only dependent on weight. Just because the weight is being rotated around some sort of axis doesn't really influence this particular drag at all. And at this point we can safely assume that, boom, myth busted, right? Well, it's not that easy. And that is because everything that has mass and is in motion is going to gain kinetic energy. And kinetic energy is obviously proportional to mass. Duh. Double the mass, double the kinetic energy at a given velocity. However, things that are rotating around some sort of axis are going to gain kinetic energy that is associated with that rotation. Things that are moving are going to gain kinetic energy that is associated with that movement. Wheels on any wheeled vehicle are obviously rotating, therefore they are storing that kind of kinetic energy, and are moving, therefore they are storing the another kinetic energy. Therefore they gain kinetic energy from two sources. So, in order to answer the question that I posed in the, well, in the title of this video, we need to answer the question, what is the magnitude of kinetic energy that is being stored in bicycle wheels? And this is the point of this video where I should introduce you to the concept of moment of inertia, angular velocity and whatnot. However, I'm not going to do it because that's not the point of this video and that would be nerdy beyond belief. Instead, what we're going to do is make as little simplification. Let's presuppose that your wheel isn't actually a bicycle wheel, but is a ring or a wire of neutronium with all the mass concentrated at the perimeter or circumference of this wheel. This allows us to make a very nice simplification of the problem, which states total kinetic energy of this wheel as it's being moved and rotated because of that movement is equal to the double kinetic energy of movement alone. And that's because obviously points on the perimeter are moving with the same linear velocity as the wheel is being moved. Simple, simple. With all that in mind, and with the usage of my homegrown software, I have made an experiment. And by the way, the link to the GitHub repository is in the description, and if it's not there, bug me for it and I will fill it in. Anyhow. Let's presuppose that we are riding on a bicycle that is weighing 6.8 kilograms, the UCI limit. The bicycle is rolling on wheels that are weighing 1.5 kilograms. The rider is weighing 75 kilograms and the input power is 200 watts. What sort of velocity are we going to achieve after 50 seconds of constant acceleration? The answer is on the screen at this very moment. Let's presuppose that we have invested in our bicycle and we have uh, managed to move 200 grams from the wheels to the bicycle. For example, it's a different bicycle. Never mind. 
We are uh, now using the same experiment, the same limitations, the same constraints, 200 watts. What sort of velocity are we going to achieve after 50 seconds of constant acceleration? The answer is on the screen right now once again. As you can see, with the second bike we are at the end of our acceleration period faster by 0.003 km per hour. Not really something well earth-shattering now, is it? Now, let's presuppose that we take our initial bike and we are simply dropping 200 grams from the wheels. Essentially, dropping the bike to 6.6 .6 kilograms and the wheels to 1.3 kilograms. Same constraints apply, 50 seconds of constant acceleration. What sort of velocity are we going to achieve? Once again, the answer is on the screen and we are once again faster by 0.004 km per hour from the previous experiment and 0.007 km per hour from the initial experiment. Well, let's discuss the results. In conclusion, we are going to be faster by using lighter wheels and we are going to be faster even more by using lighter wheels on a lighter bike. However, now let me use my script, I'm going to read you some data that's going to put this in a different perspective. Now, in experiment 1 we have traveled 364.1 meters. In experiment 2 we have traveled 364.27 meters. So we are 17 with a change centimeters further than in experiment 1. In experiment 3 we have traveled 364.45 meters. Thusly we are 70 or 70? 35-ish centimeters further than experiment 1. Now, that's a total improvement of, of 400th of a percent in experiment 2 and 800th of a percent in experiment 3. Now, is that significant? Well, let's discuss. And let's start this discussion with four important caveats. One, our model for a wheel is grossly overestimating the amount of kinetic energy this wheel is storing because we are using a ring of neutronium and this ring of neutronium has all of its mass at the edge. However, in realistic wheels, quite a bit of its mass is stored in the hub and the wheel has a certain amount of girth to it. So, it's going to be less in the realistic wheel. Now, two, we are accelerating from zero to whatever speed. However, when you're normal riding, at least on the road, you're going to be spending most of your time in a quite narrow range of speed, so the uh, fluctuations of the kinetic energy are going to be much more minute. So, we're going to be gaining much less than what I shown. Three, I am kind of assuming that you are switching the wheel to something that is identical in uh, well any other thing than its mass. Because if you're switching to a wheel that is lighter but less aerodynamic, you are most likely going to be losing in this exchange because aerodynamics is much more pronounced in bicycle dynamics than the rotating mass, obviously. And four, obviously as well, you are going to be getting some sort of accumulative benefits from just about any optimization. However, with this particular one, we can kind of estimate that what you're going to be getting is, I know, one or two or three or five meters over a hundred mile ride. And that's not really significant, that's even less than hundredth of a percent of what have you. All in all, all things considered, you need to use massively lighter wheels in order to reap any tangible benefits from reducing rotating weight. And by uh, massively, I mean 10 kilograms lighter or something like that. Because within the range of weights of your typical bicycle gear, well, reduction of rotating weight gives you very, 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 very minute benefits. Now, of course, if being uh, 30 centimeters further than the other guy meant that I am winning the race and I have won everything and everyone loves me and the other guy is the one that everyone forgets about, then I would be worrying. However, if you are in a friendly competition with your friends and you're spending thousands to be a foot further than the other guy, then you might want to reconsider your friendships. Anyhow, I'm not a pro, I think neither of you are, and well, while I'm not riding with people, most of you probably do. However, if you're not getting paid for riding, well, worrying about rotating weight is completely pointless. Anyhow, I think this is everything I have to say about the topic, at least for now. I hope you enjoyed this video. I am really hoping that you're going to share it around because that's going to help the channel grow and my ego with it, obviously. I hope you're going to thumb it up for the same reason and I hope to see you on the next one. And a little off-the-cuff unscripted post video for the person who is going to bring it up because that person is going to bring it up. I mean, write the comment that makes YouTube notice the channel and make it grow. However, I'm going to address 
your issues right now. No, you cannot feel the difference between a heavier and a lighter wheel cell you own because the changes or the differences we are discussing here are below the perception level of a human. They are below the perception level of electronics. GPS errors or GPS positioning errors are larger by an order of, of magnitude or two orders of magnitude than the differences between having a kilogram or something like that on your wheel. So no, you cannot feel anything. You're lying to yourself or lying to everyone else.